Now when they repeat like a mantra, we will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. I'm curious, how long will it take? Like in Afghanistan, where it took 20 years to realize that you lost, or in Iraq, where you also left. Although now you are trying to stay despite the Iraqi parliament's decision that the U.S. should withdraw its troops. Or like in Libya, where the state collapsed and now everyone is trying to piece it back together. A multipolar world is a reality. It's not something someone invented. Hello, everybody. So last week, I showed you the speech that Sergei Lavrov gave at the United Nations on July 16th. You can watch that one here if you haven't seen it already. Right after that speech, he also gave a press conference at the UN headquarters in which he touched on many important topics, including Russia's position on peace negotiations with Ukraine and the horrible situation in Gaza. The full press conference is linked in the description. But one aspect I found particularly interesting, and I would like to point that out to you, that is how Russia sees multipolarity arising now, naturally, and how Moscow is supporting this process. I clipped these parts together so that you can get an idea of what to expect from Russia in this multilateral and organic process. I'll give some more comments after the videos, but now have a listen first. Mr. Minister, I represent Chinese television. On May 28th, US President Biden said in an interview that China's economy is on the brink of collapse. In your opinion, what are the results of the Chinese economy's performance? Could you explain why an economy that, according to Biden, is on the brink of collapse is called a decisive factor by NATO in the Ukrainian conflict? How can an economy on the brink become a decisive factor contributing to the conflict, as stated in NATO's communique regarding China? How does this statement relate to reality? The Chinese economy is developing powerfully and rapidly. Yes, attempts are being made to stop it. Just recently, when Chairman Xi Jinping was in France, he was not only in talks with Macron, but also with Ursula von der Leyen. Representatives of the European Union publicly stated following these negotiations that they demanded China reduce the production of high-tech goods because the West has lost its competitiveness. How does this align with the principles of a free market and fair competition? The West wants to slow down China's economy. In addition to demands to stop producing a lot of cheap and high-quality products, sanctions are being applied to slow down the technological development of China in other sectors of the economy. But there should be no doubt. The more restrictions that completely discredit the model of globalization and unity of the world economy promoted by the West, the more actively and effectively the countries against which these sanctions are applied will work and create their own technologies and products. This, of course, includes the People's Republic of China, the Russian Federation, and many others. Regarding China, it is interesting that I read a statement, I can't remember exactly now, but I think it was made by Stoltenberg. He was commenting on the military exercises that took place between China and Belarus on Belarusian territory. And he seriously, with such pathos, declared that this is a dangerous matter because China is approaching NATO. But the fact that the Americans approached China long ago, that they are surrounding China and Russia too, where all this is happening on our borders, with block structures like AUKUS and the USA, Japan, Korea, the USA and South Korea are making agreements on joint nuclear policy and much more. They are trying to split the region, to pull some countries into their ranks, into the ranks of these closed block structures. And NATO itself has decided to advance the infrastructure of this block into the Indo-Pacific region. And practical steps are already being taken. Stoltenberg stated in response to the question, how come you always called yourselves a defensive alliance, an alliance for the protection of member countries' territories? He says, yes, we remain a defensive alliance, but there are threats to our alliance.
теперь глобальный, поэтому мы должны идти в Индо-Тихоокеанский Now it is global, so we must go to the Indo-Pacific region. But I think the aggressive and unjust nature of such a position is clear to everyone. Together with the People's Republic of China and our other partners within the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in contacts with ASEAN, with the Cooperation Council for the Arab States of the Gulf, we advocate for a security model that will be Eurasian. It will be based on equality, the indivisibility of security, and full mutual consideration of interests on the balance of these interests. I think this model has a future, but it will take a lot of time. I think that this model of the future, of course, will require a little bit of time, when the United States entered the world when the United States entered the world stage in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, how did it end? What peaceful changes for the better occurred there? Now when they repeat like a mantra, we will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. I'm curious, how long will it take? Like in Afghanistan, where it took 20 years to realize that you lost, or in Iraq, where you also left. Although now you are trying to stay despite the Iraqi parliament's decision that the U.S. should withdraw its troops. Or like in Libya, where the state collapsed and now everyone is trying to piece it back together. A multipolar world is a reality. It's not something someone invented. If you look at the share of the USA and the West in the global gross domestic product 50 years ago, 20 years ago, and now, you will see that the situation has changed. A couple of years ago, BRICS countries, in terms of gross national product by purchasing power parity, surpassed the G7 countries. And now, with five more countries added to BRICS, this ratio will only increase. But the USA is doing everything to ensure that this real weight in the global economy and finance of new growth centers is not reflected in the activities of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The USA holds on to the voting package that belongs to them, about 15% which according to IMF rules allows them to block decisions. Although, to be fair, it has long been necessary to redistribute these quotas, these votes, as the BRICS countries insist. This will be one of the main economic and financial issues at the BRICS summit in Kazan in October this year. In the World Trade Organization, which was promoted to all of us as the optimal and fair regulator of world trade, the situation has changed. As soon as China began to surpass the United States in competition, developing its economy on the principles of globalization that were invented by the Americans and offered to everyone, the U.S. started to act. China began to outplay them on their own field in the economy. And the U.S. simply shut down the World Trade Organization's dispute resolution body. Technical tricks were used, and now there is no quorum. For many years, all the complaints that China rightly directed at the U.S.'s protectionist policy have been lying dormant. Therefore, the reform of the World Trade Organization is on the BRICS agenda. We will strive for this, and these topics are already, and of course will be, among the main ones at the G20 summit in Rio de Janeiro. This structure should fairly consider real matters in the global economy and take steps for its development in such a way that there is mutual benefit corresponding to the contribution to the world economy. Now, if we take Eurasia, there is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, ASEAN. All these structures have agreements with China on harmonizing integration projects with the Chinese One Belt, One Road project. The countries of the Persian Gulf are also located here, which, by the way, is also Eurasia. And so all these organizations establishing contacts among themselves create the fabric of future material interaction on the Eurasian continent, based on the comparative advantages of a unified space rich in natural resources and important from the perspective of maritime communications.
We actively encourage these processes. At the same time, after the United States, together with its allies, imposed unprecedented sanctions against Russia, Iran, and Venezuela, as well as against China and many other countries, nations in Africa and Latin America began to think about how to protect themselves from such whims. Because no one knows who the Americans will get angry with in the future. For example, at last year's G20 summit, President Lula actively promoted the idea of creating alternative payment platforms and settlement mechanisms within BRICS. This is being handled by the finance ministers and central bank governors of BRICS. Recommendations will be prepared for the summit. By the way, President Lula also suggested considering the move towards a common currency within CELAC. Everyone is trying to protect themselves. Recently, Saudi Arabia stated that in a situation where the United States and the entire collective West want to freeze Russian money, they will think about how to be less dependent on the dollar. The process of de-dollarization is underway, and it cannot be stopped. By the way, Donald Trump was mentioned today. He said that it is suicidal for the United States. But this process was initiated by the United States itself. Therefore, regional structures such as the African Union, CELAC, and Asian organizations which I mentioned are already in contact with each other. And of course, on a global level. BRICS has all the capabilities to serve as a harmonizer of processes in other regions of the global majority. The Group of 20, which I mentioned, will certainly remain, where the global majority will continue to communicate with the West, if, of course, the West is ready to do so honestly. The United Nations will remain, where everyone is represented and everyone must communicate. Yesterday, Peter Sijarto, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hungary, spoke on this topic. He said that he had always been sure that the UN was created to communicate with everyone, not to support the ambitions of the West. Now everything is different. The West has decided that the UN was created to reinforce its excessive ambitions and to play the role of hegemon on the world stage. I think that at some point the United States will understand that it is better to be part of a constructive process than to use sanctions and military force, making everyone dance to its tune. Moreover, the tune often changes. Four years, and a different tune. Everyone tries to adapt somehow, but now they already understand that it is not easy, considering the specifics of the internal political processes in the United States. Okay, so let me add just a few comments. First about the content and then lastly about the form of what we just saw. First, I think it is quite remarkable that overall Mr. Lavrov, just like Mr. Putin before, actually view what is currently going on with this drive toward multipolarity as a process. And they view it first and foremost as a process and not as an end goal. It's not the case that in the end we get to multipolarity. We are already in a multipolar system and whatever is going to come is going to come out of this process that we are seeing playing out in front of our eyes. And then he gives a couple of um, reasons or factors why this is happening. So this is to me an important dif difference from how I see how NATO countries and the collective West generally frames issues. They they always look at the outcomes they want to achieve, like having a war <laughs> with China or um, militarizing borders. Uh, they don't look at the general system in which they want to live or that, that you would want to produce the entire globe. The, the NATO approach is always trying to define 
um, where to do what and how it has to happen and then and then reason backwards of like what do we need to get in order to do uh, to have the capabilities to do interventions um, what Russia is laying out here is how they are viewing how the system is now developing and in the system they are just one part and then you've got the other parts and then you look at the push and pull factors um, for for the following developments and interestingly that's the second point the future that they are seeing coming does not exclude the United States. He's saying that very clearly. The US has a space, has a place in this as well. And of course it will play a role because it would be lunatic to think that the US will just disappear or that you can build a system that um, that that doesn't take into account the United States. Naturally, any kind of global uh, order that will come or that that's going to develop will include the United States because it is such a powerful country and every country more or less is included. I mean, we don't get rid of, of plots of land. So the Russian analysis of what's going to come still includes the US. And the, the question to, to the Global South countries really is how to manage this transi transition in a way to get the US to become cooperative and collaborative in this, uh, in this new environment. Uh, without actually um, without wars than ensuing all the time and I think that's what's going through their mind the third point is that um, they are clearly viewing US actions and NATO actions secondary I mean we know NATO is basically the extension of, of US foreign policy right and then uh, down downstream somewhere there's is Europe also following but they the Russians view their actions as one of the driving factors. So it's not necessarily something that the Russians still need to do very much. I mean, of course, Russia uh, and China, as Lavrov sees it, have to do a lot to counter these actions. But it's actually the, the primary reason why we have a development toward multipolarity is because the US is acting the way it does. It is because NATO is trying to, to push itself on, in, into other regions. It's because there is this constant drumbeat of uh, follow the rules-based order, follow the rules-based order, that is not an, a, a, a fair distribution of how the world world is, and other countries see that. And hence, you've got a counter-reaction, and he views that as a natural counter-reaction, of which Russia is a part of, but it's not the only... Uh, is not the only participant. So uh, overall, I think the, the Russians are relatively um, uh, relaxed about this because they do understand that the that multipolarity is not something that they need to to whip up with with a big long stick. It's something that's gonna come naturally as long as they and as long as they play a constructive role, then you can facilitate the uh, the move into this into this future where where power is going to be more distributed um, although it already is right it, it that's that's a very important part but uh, to me the insight here is that um again a part of this process where that russia sees itself as one part of this whole thing and then the fourth point really is also this unequal nature of the system that is being championed by the united states and the that goes together with the point before, right? That this counter reaction that we're seeing is a counter reaction, not necessarily against Washington per se, and it's certainly not a counter reaction against all of the values that are being uh, touted from the from the collective West against it's against freedom, against liberty, against democracy. It's not about that. The core issue, as Mr. Lavrov presents it, is this rules-based international order system which is not international law which is not equal and fair to all the member states it is as chas freeman in a um in a, in a in a brilliant talk recently that i that i uploaded about a week ago um explained and i'll, I'll try to link it as well the rules-based international order is the principle of rule by law that you use the law in order to make everybody follow and you you keep saying that the law is what the law is what the law is what the law is and you have to follow 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 but only the groups 
of uh, targets have to follow that you designate as such and you take you, other groups you completely exempt from that you exempt yourself often and the rules of the rules by law are never spelled out they're not written down because as soon as they're written down you would actually you would run the risk that you have to follow those as well but you never actually write them down you just claim that they're there and then de designate who has to follow what's what's apparently being said but there's constant constant exemptions for yourself and your buddies right the, it's the opposite of the rule of law where the law is written down and we have that we have international law but we see time and again how the us how europe how nato is breaking these rules and that's that's why they don't call them uh, their their rules for them so they use this differently right they they have a differential understanding of um, who has to follow what kind of rules and that that is something that a lot of other countries around the globe in the global south that they don't accept it they see it they understand it and they intuitively now rally against it and they try to do something about it and the harder the u.s tries to push this down the throats of everybody the harder the counter reaction is gonna is is, is coming and the more they will start building uh, the frameworks that will allow them to escape so it's not making an alternative structure for the sake of having alternative structure it's, it's the alternative structure for the sake of not um, being dependent anymore of what can be used to whip them into uh, into submission. And in this sense, a fairer world doesn't necessarily mean uh, one in which um, everything is, all the problems are solved. It's a world in which the rules are more clearly spelled out and where the decision-making power is more distributed. Now, the... Um, the last thing maybe then about the form of what we've seen, what I find most remarkable is that the uh, this analysis or this, this, this press conference really resembled more an analysis of world affairs than a, um, a reproduction of the standpoint and viewpoint of Russia, although that was also included, especially when it came to Ukraine and so on. But what we are seeing with Mr. Lavrov here and with, with other world leaders from the global south as well is that what they're trying to do is to explain how they view international relations at the moment and to me it seems that they have a pretty realistic view of what is going on and how these different these different um uh, action reaction uh, uh, processes then work and create what we are seeing and in this sense what we are getting from Washington from Berlin is often more of a kind of a fantasy world and uh, you who are listening to this you you probably understand what I mean we, we we hear a lot of what the West wants to be the case like when we've been hearing for two years that uh, ukraine is winning ukraine is winning ukraine is winning uh russia's losing russia's losing and the russians are going to run away and they create this outcome that they want to be the case and then the argumentation starts whereas it seems to me that the russians are really making a point of trying to analyze what is actually going on on the ground and what is going on in different places and then take decision, decisions based on that. They don't create a fantasy world. And in this sense, I do think the analysis is just more appropriate. And this is then where people from the collective West and who are inside the collective West bubble get angry at us and call us Putin puppets and repeating Russian talking points. They usually don't say we repeat Russian lies because they know that, that, that all of these things that Mr. Lavrov says over there are actually not lies. They are actually facts. But a talking point is not the same as a lie. And they know that. They just don't like it when this, this counter analysis of international relations when that is being propagated what they want is their version of reality to be believed internalized and then acted accordingly um what, no, whether they do that knowingly or not now um lavrov and 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 uh, colleagues from China and colleagues from from ASEAN and so on that I talk uh, that the people also the people that I talk to I, I never talk to Lavrov <laughs> but the people that I talk to who have similar analysis they understand that this that this fantasy world of the West it just has nothing to do with the realities that they are seeing and then they take they take different um, um, they learn different things from what the 
collective West beliefs should be learned. And that's then where this friction starts, um, where, where um, especially um, like people indoctrinated within the little bubble then start uh, accusing everybody else of, of not living in reality because they don't live in their reality. They don't judge things the same way. And mis that's why this one of the most powerful things uh, Sergei Lavrov can do time and again is just give good and proper analysis. <laughs> and even though it is absolutely clear that he too, of course, gives it a spin and, and adds, the, adds the, the points that Russia would, would want to be believed and would want um, everybody else to also follow along, that at the end of the day, the most important thing is to give a proper um, overview of what is what can be observed and then the fact that the collective West countries are unable not, not, not just unwilling, but unable to understand the world from the viewpoint of other people and other places, you know, what the, what, what the world looks like from looking at it from Jakarta, looking at it from Singapore, looking at it from Beijing, looking at it from Moscow, the inability of doing that, that's really what currently is, is driving a lot of the madness that we are seeing coming out of the US and, uh, and Europe, this little mental prison that they're in. So uh, Sergei Lavrov, I think correctly here, um, approaches this by simply giving more of the uh, more analysis of how things should be looked at in a more um, in a more rational, rational manner and action reaction patterns. And he they, he keeps repeating that in most of his speeches, in, mo in, in, in most of the things that he does, like uh, be less angry, although sometimes there's anger too, of course, but uh, just do analysis. And then for us, the, the, the challenge is to, to figure out whether that analysis then um, stand, will stand the test of time and whether um, historians in the future will actually be on a more or less same page or whether we are, we are being misled into another, into another way of thinking that doesn't, that doesn't portray everything that's going on on the ground um, properly. But, um, well, that's the challenge of a thinking world. Thank you very much for your attention today.